Hello there everyone, Decadence Reviews here, and today, I'm going to be reviewing Spyro 3 Year of the Dragon, the third and final Spyro game developed by Insomniac Games. Like I stated with Spyro 2 Ripto's Rage, I also didn't play Year of the Dragon during my childhood as well because I was still hooked on Pokemon Gold at the time, so like Ripto's Rage, I don't have any nostalgic memories playing this game at all. Anyway, a lot of people were very surprised and upset that this would be the last Spyro game developed by Insomniac Games, and who could blame them? Insomniac Games really put so much effort into the lovable purple dragon. Even the people at Insomniac Games considered Spyro their baby, so it must have been hard to part ways with the series. Ripto's Rage was a pretty solid game that pretty much improved upon everything wrong with the first game. So how did Year of the Dragon stack up? Was it a brilliant conclusion to the trilogy? Well, let's find out, shall we? Before I begin the review, here's a little background information on the game. After the positive responses from Spyro 2 Ripto's Rage, it was a given that people would be wanting a new Spyro game. The development for the Year of the Dragon took about 10.5 months and was released on October 25th, 2000. The biggest change in the game was the inclusion of new playable characters that offered their own unique playstyles to help change up the gameplay. Despite the positive reception the game received, the creators pretty much had no more ideas for Spyro and felt it was best to part ways and move on to a new game series. Anyway, let's get on with the review. The story begins with Spyro and his friends resting after celebrating the Year of the Dragon, a special event that only happens every 12 years when new dragon eggs are brought into the dragon realm. However, a hooded rabbit girl named Bianca along with an army of Rhinox show up and steal all of the eggs. Fortunately for the dragons, she carelessly steps on Hunter's tail which causes him to wake up in a panic and wake all the other dragons in the process. Unfortunately, Bianca and the Rhinox are able to escape unscathed with all the eggs. Spyro, Sparks, and Hunter are sent to the other realm to go rescue all of the stolen dragon eggs and thus the adventure begins. Later we learn that Bianca works for an evil sorceress who scatters the dragon eggs all across the land. The story is anything special. It is simple and lighthearted which is a staple for 3D platform games, but they do add in some romantic tension between Hunter and Bianca which I suppose is kinda cute. Anyway, the gameplay for Spyro is pretty much the same from Mythos Rage where he still uses his signature flame, charge, and gliding mechanics. The main thing here is that you're tasked to find dragon eggs which are scattered throughout levels. The funny thing is that when you do find them, they conveniently hatch right in front of you and are pre-named. Pretty neat if you ask me, but wait a minute. If the dragons are hatched from eggs like birds, and the first thing that they see they consider their parent, Sparrow is like a dad to every single baby dragon he rescues. Awkward. All jokes aside, other than the eggs you are still collecting gems and making your way to the end of a level. However, along your way you'll come across these teleportation portals that lead you to all sorts of mini game challenges. From protecting an ice skating bear from Rhinox jerks trying to jeopardize her performance, playing cat ice hockey, yep, you heard it right, cat ice hockey, and having a sky battle with twin Chinese style dragons. Just pure awesome, but of course, one of the more popular minigames beloved by many are the skateboarding challenges. I have to say that the controls work rather well for Spyro, and I know that they took some inspiration from the Tony Hawk Pro Skater series, which is radical in my book. Wait, did I just say radical? <laughs> Anyway, other than that, there isn't much about Spyro's gameplay that was touched upon. The real point of interest was the inclusion of the five new playable characters. You see, on your adventure, you'll run into that greedy SOB Moneybags, who is seen guarding locked up animals who he will free for you for a small fee. Upon releasing them, you'll be able to play as them. Don't worry though, Moneybags gets what's coming to him on so many occasions when you free your new friends. So, who are Spyro's new pals? Well, first you have the adventurous Sheila the Kangaroo, who specializes in super high jumps and using her feet to knock out enemies. Next you have Sergeant Bird, a penguin war veteran who specializes in missile projectiles and flying. Yeah, I get what you're thinking. Um, penguins don't fly. Well, this one does apparently. The third character is the highly intelligent and sophisticated Bentley the Yeti. His main weapon is his ice club that he uses to smack down enemies or reflect projectiles by trolling said ice club. The fourth character we have is the wacky, energetic Agent 9 the Monkey. He mainly uses his blaster gun and bombs. His gameplay is pretty much that of a third person shooter, but he also has the feature to go first person shooter in some bet levels. The last playable character is your buddy Sparks. His gameplay pretty much plays like that of an arcade top down shooter where you navigate from point A to point B while picking up power ups and defeating a boss at the end of each level. Despite there being 5 new playable characters, the gameplay is still heavily carried by Spyro. It's about 50-50, but it's enough to keep you thoroughly entertained depending on how you feel about the other characters. This game has 4 main homeworlds which are based off of times of the day. You have Sunrise Spring, Midday Gardens, 
Evening Lake, and Midnight Mountain. I have to say that these homeworlds do feel a little smaller compared to the ones in Ripto's Rage, but that's not necessarily a bad thing. They aren't anything too special to be honest, but they can be fun to explore. Each homeworld has 4 main levels and 3 extra levels which consist of a level for the character you freed, a level for Sparks, a Speedway level, and a boss stage. The main levels play pretty much the same as the last game, so I'll talk about the Speedway levels. This time around, you have 3 missions to complete. You still have your standard time trial, where you collect 4 targets and a hidden mini game where you challenge Hunter to a game. The newest feature in the Speedway are the racing segments, where you race various creatures of the Speedway. I have to say that the new racing segments are pretty fun to play through, so personally, the Speedways are at their best in this game, with more variety of speed plays. The only disappointing thing I can think of is that they took out the intro and outro cutscenes that were used in Ripto's Rage. I know it's a small thing, but I thought they were a very nice touch in the last game and I would have loved to see them continued in this game. It really made you feel more connected to the world and its inhabitants. On the plus side, for you traditional gaming fans, there is a guest appearance. Well, more like guest parody, but nevertheless, we get a cameo of Tomb Raider's Lara Croft as a young mouse named Tara Croft. I thought this was pretty cool as Tomb Raider was quite popular at the time, so to see a cameo like this in a Spyro game was quite entertaining. So what about the boss battles? Well, they don't disappoint at all. Like Crypto's Rage, they offer a good challenge with a simple pattern and they feel mildly threatening, especially the second and third bosses since they are pretty big in stature and tower over Spyro. My personal favorite boss is definitely the third one as he looks like an awesome gargoyle. What? I like gargoyles. Don't judge me. The graphics look pretty much like they did in Ripto's Rage with some slight polish, especially when you compare Hunter's render model from the last game. The levels look pretty detailed and very colorful which is a staple for 3D platformers. With that said, the graphics are nice for the PS1. Yes, I know that Dreamcast was out during 2000 with games like Shenmue, Dead or Alive 2, and Resident Evil Code Veronica that graced us with beautiful and smooth looking graphics. But remember, the PS1 could only practice so much data so you shouldn't be too hard on it. The music is once again composed by Stuart Copeland, however he is also accompanied by Ryan Beveridge. Just like the first two games, the music is nice and pleasing to the ear. Though I have to say that the theme they used for the Sorceress boss battle was very unfitting as they reused the Sunrise Spring theme music for it. Compared to Ripto's awesome opera choir styled song, which had to be one of the most creative boss themes I've ever heard in a video game, the Sorceress's battle theme was a big disappointment. But with that said, the overall music in Gear of the Dragon isn't bad at all. In fact, the theme song for the level Fireworks Factory is one of the best songs in the game. I don't have too many negatives, though I have to bring up the new characters. I understand what the creators are trying to do, but I feel that 5 was a bit overkill. I didn't mind Sheila or Agent 9, but I completely loathed playing as Benly and Sergeant Bird. Benly is by far the slowest character in the game and I'm generally not a fan of painfully slow characters. Sergeant Bird is a little better, but he feels clunky and loose in control. Sheila, Agent 9, and Sparks handle just fine, and I did enjoy their gameplay, but these two? Just no. The other gripe I have are some of the minigames. The tank you use in the Haunted Tomb minigame was a pain in the ass to control, and the Bentley Boxing minigame was bloody awful, and I say this as a fan of fighting games. You really won't know what I'm talking about until you play this minigame for yourself. All in all, I can see why this game is considered the best in the trilogy, and it really is an enjoyable game, but I have to say that I personally like Ripto's Rage slightly more. Believe me, Year of the Dragon was a close one as I've replayed this game so many times, but I can't deny the things that annoyed me in this game, like Bentley and Sergeant Burr's slow gameplay, and the horrible controls with the vehicles. So with all that said, I give Spyro 3 Year of the Dragon a golden, 4 out of 5 stars. It was almost a near perfect game, and don't get me wrong, I don't hate this game at all. It's one of the best 3D platformers out there, but I feel that Ripto's Rage had a more grounded style. However, if you haven't played this game, I highly recommend it. While the first Spyro the Dragon game doesn't really hold up all that well today, the latter two definitely stand the test of time. And well, that concludes my review for the original Spyro trilogy. As mentioned earlier, this was the Summonite Games' last Spyro game. After Year of the Dragon, they moved on to the Ratchet & Clank series, a franchise that is one of my all-time favorites. While it was sad to see them part ways with Spyro, it was probably for the best. I mean, at least the development team were honest, admitting they ran out of ideas for Spyro. And considering what Spyro has been going through since the Year of the Dragon, I think it would have been best for the Little Purple Dragon to retire with dignity. This is strictly my own opinion though, because I know there are some people out there who would like the newer games. Will I be reviewing any of the other Spyro games? Maybe. 
I think it will be interesting to analyze them, but as of right now, I have no plans to review them. With that said, stay tuned for more videos coming soon. Oh hey, you're still here? Well, cool. Thank you again for watching my review of Spiral 3 Year of the Dragon. I hope that you enjoyed it. What do you guys think? What is your favorite Spiral game? If you want to see more video game related content, feel free to hit the subscribe button for future videos coming soon. Thank you so much for watching, and I will catch you in the next video. See ya!